have the faith, then it will dictate our actions and our preferences in our lives. It's very important today world in today's world to sit together with all the people of faith who believe in God. I was earlier talking to Reverend Cedric just a few minutes before. The faithful in the world are many, many more than the non-believers. But they are scattered, not united, not meeting each other, no. not understanding each other. Whereas the forces of evil are very small. Those who don't believe and they don't want anybody else to believe. But they are very united in their cause. The world is in trouble today because those who believe, they don't care about the others who believe. And therefore, being more in number, more in strength, they are helpless. Therefore, tonight's event is very important in its nature. And this will not be the last one. We hope uh, this is the beginning and we will have many such events. We will come close to each other and we will understand each other better and we will try to shape uh, the world into a better one. Uh, I remember some eight years from now, Dr. Bhutta and I we were looking for space in this area because the mosque was going under refurbishment and Juma prayer particularly was a problem where we will pray. When we went to St. Mary's Church, uh, Reverend Cedric joined the church later, but we were offered the hall. Although because of the views, we weren't able to pay there. But their generosity and their hospitality still is very close to our heart. And now, <clears throat> uh, inshallah, God willing, this relationship will grow and we will be closer to each other. Uh, I introduce the uh, guest speakers. On my right uh, is Reverend Cedric Blackie. Uh, who is the Vice Provost of St. Mary's Church, uh, <clears throat> very close to us here. Next uh, to him is Sheikh Sohail Saeed, uh, a young scholar, Muslim scholar. Um, and uh, the last one on my left is uh, Dr. Irfan Jahangir. And we have, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, two very renowned as well as eminent scholars with us, who I'm hoping will give us the understanding as well as the path illuminating that for us for future inshallah and they're well qualified alhamdulillah both of them as i can i'll say, go through very really briefly i won't give the whole they have a full cv of both of them in front of me it will take ages to go through that so i'll just briefly pick up those things which i found very important and that's okay for both of yourselves um, sheikh Sohib, sheikh is um, a title given to a person who is learned as a scholar and Sheikh Sohib, mashallah, uh, fulfills that criteria by all, by all aspects, alhamdulillah. He's an Arabic tutor at the Edinburgh University at the moment, and it's honorary Muslim chaplain as well. Now, he started his career as a philosopher. He done his MSc in philosophy, but landed in Egypt, Al-Azhar, and completed Quranic studies, alhamdulillah, at Al-Azhar University. He's presently working on the doctorate at the University of London, and... He's very well known among the uh, circles in, in Glasgow and Scotland, alhamdulillah. He has delivered many speeches, many talks in schools, in youth groups, among interfaith groups. He also is very well, very well represented in the media and especially some of the important topics which sometimes people find a taboo to talk about, like music and spirituality. And alhamdulillah, alongside people from other faiths, Christianity as well as Judaism, they were brothers in 2010, 2007, when talks were delivered on those areas which people sometimes feel iffy and edgy about, talking about. And Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Sahib is one of them who can call a spade a spade and without the fear of people judging him or others, inshallah. So we hope, inshallah, starting on that, uh, Sheikh Sahib will keep that, that promise going, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sheikh Sahib. I begin with the praise of Almighty God, our Creator, and asking him to send his blessings and peace upon all of his noble prophets and messengers whom he sent as guides to take people out of darkness into light. And I greet all of you with a word of peace 
Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. Um, the first thing that uh, comes to my mind when, when I'm asked to speak on a topic is I look at the title. And the title that we have for our discussion today, our dialogue today, is My Faith, My Compass. So I had just met Reverend Cedric just for the first time uh, before we began the program. And he, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a compass. So there it is. So for anyone who's not quite sure what a compass is, this is, this is an example of one, if you don't mind. Um, and first of all, let me say um, how honored we are to have uh, all our guests here in the mosque with us today. Um, at their head, of course, a reverend friend, not his first time in the mosque, I know that. Um, although perhaps I was abroad in previous times when we've had the opportunity to, to engage. And it's very important for us here as a local mosque in the West End to have that close relationship, that friendship and that companionship with uh, those who belong to our neighbouring faith communities, especially here um, in, in the one neighbourhood. Thinking about a compass, um, I started to ask myself, is it the faith that's a compass or is it as a Muslim that I believe that the Qur'an is a compass or is it the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who is a compass? I think all of these things could be said. The Qur'an describes itself as being there to bring people out of darkness into light and to guide people to that which is best and upright. To guide people to that which will give them success in this life and in the next life. When we will be raised and asked about our deeds. And I remember the incident when the Prophet Muhammad was escaping from his hometown of Mecca, escaping persecution, and he was with his close companion Abu Bakr. And when his companion was asked by a stranger on the way, who is this with you? He didn't want to give away that this is Muhammad who is fleeing from Mecca, because then his enemies may try to catch up with him. So he said, he is a guide who is showing me the way. Just like someone who shows him the way through the mountain pass, and might make use of a compass for the purpose. Abu Bakr was not lying because telling lies is a major sin and a serious uh, error in Islam. But rather he was saying that he is a guide who is guiding me through this life, through the mountain passes, through the rocky terrain, to reach success on the other side. Or is it faith that's a compass? Is it faith in God, faith in the one God, faith in the Creator, Faith in our sustainer and loving cherisher. Faith in our guide and saviour. In fact, we can, we can say it is all of these things. But I want to think of just a few ways in which I believe that Islam is a compass or is a guide. For me personally and for uh, over a billion Muslims around the world. The first is that it guides us to recognise and understand and appreciate the purpose of life. The purpose of life which the Quran describes as being to worship God. The Quran says in, upon the, the voice of God, saying that I did not create human beings except to worship me. So this is the big question that people ask all the time. What is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life? Well, this is the answer. Instead of, you know, searching in the cosmos and, and, and searching everywhere around us in the world to try to find this answer, Islam says, well, this is the answer. The purpose is to worship God. Now take that and strive and travel in the cosmos and travel in the world and apply this reality that our only purpose is to worship God. And worshipping, I think you will realize without difficulty, is not limited to only the act of bowing down in prayer or reciting holy scriptures or reciting the names of God. But worship, in the Islamic point of view, is all actions that are done in this life, seeking God's pleasure. All those things which are done which are lawful and done with a good and pure and noble intention. So even a common act such as eating and drinking or going to sleep and waking up these are things which may be termed as worship when they are done with the name of God and 
seeking his pleasure and remembering him at every occasion. So this is something which we believe is inherent in the human character, that we are created with our compass already pointing towards God. And it's a matter of following it. Because the Quran tells us that there was a time before we were created in the form that we are in now. Before we came into our bodies. When our souls were addressed by their creator in some primordial sphere that we do not understand. And God said to them, God said to us, Am I not your Lord? And we said, Yes, O Lord, yes indeed you are. And so we have already, before we were created, before we were born, we testify to the oneness of God. And we testify to our relationship to our Creator and our purpose in life. So the compass here is about finding that inner direction with which we are created. The second sphere in which I feel that it's fair to say that faith is a compass is in the, in the sphere of morality. So just as it is a compass to distinguish between right, uh, between true and false, it is also a compass between right and wrong. A morality is something, again, a human nature inclines towards good and recognizing good and runs away from evil. But we talk a lot about the moral compass and how a person's moral compass can become skewed. Just like this compass could become skewed if I hold a magnet next to it. So the human moral compass can also become skewed. So that is why in order to truly understand what is right, what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, we need to be oriented towards the guidance which comes in the revelation from God Almighty. And some of that is general principles. A lot of people speak in interfaith contexts about something which is called the golden rule. And the golden rule essentially says, treat others as you would like to be treated. Or don't treat other people as you would not accept to be treated yourself. And this is a, a principle which I've written a paper on, essentially just showing how Islam contains and advocates this principle as one way to distinguish between right and wrong. But Islam also contains other general guidance and general principles or rules of thumb such as that saying of the Prophet peace be upon him the Prophet Muhammad said that religion is sincerity and when he was asked to whom O Messenger of God he said it is to be sincere to God and to, to his Prophet and to his book and to all the believers whether the leaders or the common folk in other words to treat everyone and to treat everything as it deserves to be treated not just as you would consent to be treated. Because you can't have that golden rule with God. Treat God as you would like to be treated. No. We worship God because He is God and deserves to be worshipped. And we deserve to know that and we deserve to be honoured by being His servants and being His worshippers. So morality, faith is also a compass because we are always aware that Almighty God is watching. He is aware that He has angels who are appointed for no purpose but to write down the good that we do or the bad that we do, the good words that we say and the bad words that we say. So knowing this and believing this, which is an essential part of every Muslim's creed, is something which should provide us that guidance. At a time when you are confronted with any situation and you have to say, do I do this or do I not do this? The first thing you should say, well, God is watching and that will be my decider as to whether I do it or not. The third aspect, and I'm only going to mention four, the third aspect is uh, in law. So just as to distinguish between right and wrong, also more specifically between the lawful and the unlawful. And of course, um, law is something which is a part and parcel of the Islamic way of life. And we are often fond of saying Islam is not only a religion, it is a way of life. And when we say that, it's because religion sometimes is understood as being specific to a ritual aspect or only towards belief and creed. Whereas, as we understand in Islam, it is not only about belief or about worship, it is also about living according to a specific code. 
And there are, in the Qur'an, which we believe to be the word-for-word -word revelation from God, and in the examples and teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, whom we believe to be the final messenger of Almighty God, they contain a number of laws, regulations, which span from the individual level and what we do in our houses and with our families, all the way up through the society and even to what is lawful and unlawful on, for, for, a, for a country, for a state, for a nation. So this is something which um, provides a comprehensive way of life. At the same time, we have to recognize that not everything is spelled out in detail. And some people nowadays are, are saying, how can you stick to a book which is 14 centuries old and you're following these ancient laws? First of all, I would say, there's no reason to uh, write something off because it is ancient or because it is old. Maybe it is old because it has stood the test of time and because therefore it is more fit for purpose than something which was thought of yesterday. But at the same time, there are changing circumstances in the world and we need to be adaptable and flexible to what happens and how technology develops and how people change and cultures vary. So there's also flexibility present in Islamic law based on the fact that not everything is spelled out, but some things are left as general principles to allow us to adapt to different places and different times. The last thing that I want to mention is how faith or how Islam is a compass in the sphere of character. Our personal character, our personal um, personality or our spirituality. And here, I really believe that it is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who is the compass in this regard. Because the Quran has described him as being uswatun hasana, as being a lofty standard or lofty example, a beautiful example of conduct and of character. So this compass is to distinguish, not between right and wrong, but between what is beautiful and what is ugly inside. Because it is inside, it is the heart or it is the soul or the spirit or the character which is more important and more defining of a human being. This compass guides us between extremes. It tells us not to be angry, not to become angry and to be people who, who lose their temper at the smallest things. But at the same time, we shouldn't be people who just accept everything. And when we see injustice in the world and blood being spilled, we just say, I won't get angry. You have to be angry for the right things and not for the wrong things. We have to be generous and we have to also have balance in how we spend, where we spend, to whom we spend, in order to be able to continue to support good in this world. So we need that compass to guide us between extremes and to prevent us also from, from following our, our whims and our ideas and our desires, which are not all good. Because a human soul, as Islam teaches, is created with the potentiality for good and for evil. Although the good is more inherent to its nature. As the soul is created with an inclination to good and an inclination to evil. So the successful person is the one who purifies his soul or her soul by doing good deeds, by seeking after God, by worshipping Him, and therefore becomes pure of spirit and of soul. Whereas somebody who follows their desires, who follows their more animal and more physical and material part to the expense of the spirit, will end up burying that soul in, in desires and end up corrupting it, and that person will be unsuccessful. The final word is that spirituality, or looking after our spirit and our character, is something that we do always thinking about what pleases God. My concern in my spirituality is to please God and not to please my own self. As this is the mistake that we see sometimes when people talk about spirituality today, it's about me. It's another aspect of individuality or individualism. But Islam teaches that directing ourselves to God is the solution for all things, whether in our faith and our belief, whether in our morality, whether in what we consider to be lawful and prohibited, or whether in our character and spirituality. And I'll conclude with these words, and I look forward to hearing the next speech. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Zakul Akhair. It's once again a privilege to, to introduce Reverend to yourselves. And as I said, I've had CVs with me, so I'm going to be very precise and try to pick up the, the best parts which I, I thought are among them. Uh, Reverend uh, Cedric Blackie was born in Sheffield, and from a very early age, as 10 years, uh, his spirit as Sheikh Sahib described the importance of spirit, was inclined towards faith and he had a first vocation for priesthood at the age of 10 years, mashallah, and he studied divinity at A level and was admitted to Cambridge to study archaeology and anthropology, but he came out with a degree in theology. So he's taken the, the part of Bible of from dust thou come and to dust thou return, literally did. He went to archaeology, subhanallah, so that's it. But he's, his main focus was uh, to look at work uh, when the millennial bug was everywhere and in everybody's mind. And it was a difficult time and people were trying to really collaborate with one another and one of the beautiful works that, that came out was in Derbyshire where they tried to formulate a multi-faith organisation and now it's up and running as a multi-faith centre at the University of Derby. So that's been a great achievement and currently as you know he's the vice provost at St Mary's Cathedral. So without further ado, we definitely like to hear from Fred Rivers. We have these at St Mary's. <laughs> this one works. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for your hospitality. It's it's a wonderful occasion, uh, and uh, uh, and it's very very good to be part of it uh, and to be here again amongst friends at uh, at uh, Alpha Khan Mosque. Uh, and friends from other places uh, tonight. Um, and uh, I feel in many ways that uh, we're all sitting and standing on holy ground. Uh, this is a place of faith, a place of worship, a place dedicated to God, a place where prayer and worship is offered through the day and through the night, um, on every day of the year. Um, but this is a, not just an assembly of people going through a, a religious ritual, but it's a, a collection of hearts that are striving to follow God uh, in a difficult circumstance in today's world, uh, but to support each other in that enterprise and support each other quite beyond these faith boundaries to other faith traditions. And it's very good to be part of that. So I'm very grateful to Dr. Butcher and other people that have uh, gone out of their way to, to make me feel welcome and to uh, explore together as we do over cups of tea and coffee and conversation uh, in all sorts of places up and down the Great Western Road. Uh, how can we develop these things? What can we learn from each other? What can we do together? And uh, for me, thinking about one of the phrases that gave birth to the multi-faith centre at the University of Derby, which had a very small part in existing, um, was the, um, the phrase from the uh, Catholic theologian Hans Kuhn, who said, and you may remember this, saying, and... and until there is peace amongst the world religions, there will be no peace in the world. It starts here. And occasions such as this cultivate a, a, a sense of commitment to that that is much more significant than just the numbers gathered here tonight. So th thank you so much for that. Um, we, we have great fun with our faith. It's very serious. It's very focused, but at St Mary's Cathedral you'll find occasions when there's great hush and stillness and deep reverence. There'll be times when it is complete chaos, even in the middle of an act of worship. And we had such an occasion last Sunday when we had a, a baptism. It was a great gathering. Now I should say to begin with that our motto at St Mary's is, is a three-word statement. And it goes like this, open, inclusive, welcoming. Now we could have another Bible study on those words in themselves, but I just would like to offer them to you to begin with, because it simply means that everyone, whoever they are, are welcome to take a full part in the activities of the cathedral whenever they want, according to conscience. But for those who want to make a specific Christian commitment, whether... Uh, as an adult or as a very young person or for a child of faithful parents, they can ask 
for baptism. Now, the word baptism is Greek, and it means to get very wet. In fact, it means to get saturated in water, like plunging under a bath. And ritual bathing and washing is a part of all faith traditions. It's a celebration of birth and death and life. And in the Episcopalian tradition to which St Mary's Cathedral belongs, it's offered to people of any age. I remember nothing of my baptism. I was six weeks old. But my mother told me that I screamed the house down. I don't know what it was occasioned, but I do remember as a very young child disliking being taken to church. It was a cold place, <laughs> and I was told to sit still and be quiet, and not to want to go to the toilet when the sermon was about to begin. <laughs> but at my baptism, I was given a gift, and I have it to this day, and I'm honoured to find it and bring it tonight. It's a holy Bible. And in it is written some words by my godmother, my Auntie Dorothy, uh, to mark the occasion of my baptism. And it was given as often gifts are given to young children um, of any tradition, but not least in the Christian tradition, that somehow this might represent something like a foundation stone in their life. If you look at it carefully, you can see that it's not been used a great deal. It's, we have different versions of the Bible. Unlike yourselves, we, we, we don't read the Bible in the original language very often. The scholars must do because we've got to understand the words. Um, I use a different translation from this, uh, which is a, really a 17th century translation, the, the King James Version, and that's another talk. For another occasion. At a baptism, there is a candidate. There's a great crowd, there's noise and anticipation. It's a bit like a gathering for a wedding, really. There are also formalities. Words, important words, formulas are said. There's a statement of purpose, like the opening of a meeting. There is the declaration of intent. Do you want this? Yes, I do. There is the making of promises. And then at the heart, before anything else happens, the declaration of faith, the compass of faith, is expressed here. Do you believe? But believe in what? Or well, we would say, wouldn't we, or believe in who? The questions are put like this in our tradition. Do you believe in God the Creator who made the world? And the candidate must say, I do. Do you believe, there are three questions, do you believe in God, the saviour who redeemed humanity? The candidate must say, I do, before we can go on any further. Do you believe, lastly, in God, the spirit who gives life to the people of God? The candidate says, I do. So it, it identifies God in three forms. Creator, Redeemer, Sanctifier, also known as the Father, the Son, the Spirit. And after the declaration of faith, then there's the journey to the font. And if you can imagine about two or three hundred people gathered in a space no bigger than this, this is where we're all gathering, around a piece of marble. But it could be anything that can contain water. It could be the River Clyde. It could be the sea. It could be the Kelvin. It could be a small bowl of water. Anything from which water can come and express the washing. There's the prayer over the water. There's the act of baptism, which is the splashing with water the anointing with oil, the givering of light, and then, of course, the photographs and the family feast. And then comes the really difficult bit, the life to come. What is the particular focus of compass that the service of baptism, the rite of baptism expresses? 
The first is a consciousness that there is a life in God who loves the creation. The creating God is at the heart of this. God did not have to make the world. Why did God in his mind and purpose bring this into being? To bring this extraordinary universe of universes. A creation which we now know through astrophysics has a beginning and an end and perhaps a rebirth in different ways. To bring into beginning at the height of all this creation we all believe human beings. At the last minute. Beings with mind, soul and spirit. Beings where he has never left himself without witness in any part of the globe and in any faith tradition or none. Why? There is a sense that it's something born out of sheer delight and the love of relationship. God loves the creation so much, cares for it. And there is a sense, therefore, with an orientation on that compass point of understanding God as maker, that suddenly one recognises one's responsibility in this context of the created order, this mystery of the universe, and this extraordinary adventure of life on which we are all set. So there is a sense of, well, we want to make sure that this earth is looked after appropriately and that it's going to be there for future generations. That it is not there just for the spoiling, for our own gain and profit. There is something beautiful in the multitude of species, of plants and animals, of mineral and of atmosphere. And every human being has a right to share it in peace and in dignity just as we do. So there is a sense, here are the sense of the birth of the senses of, of justice, fairness, peace, and the responsibility for the earth, for others, and for our responsibility in our studying, in our households, in our work, in our political action, and in our work to make this a fair and good place to be. We think that in the world globally, but we think it more specifically about the city of Glasgow and this country of Scotland. How can we make this a good place to be? There is that compass bearing then for us, recognising as God creator. And then there is this second point of the compass. God saviour. It is not just enough to let it be. A consciousness and a faith that looks at the person and work of the prophet Jesus, the person that we, in the Christian tradition, see God so fully reflected in that we call this person's God's son. God is as much, Jesus is as much, has God in, expressed in his life as humanity expressed in his life. So there is all the reverence there, but there is this extraordinary thing that happens in this last three years of his life, following his own baptism and death, that this is a journey of self-giving, of teaching, of healing, but then at the end, confrontation with the powers that be that lead to his death on the cross just outside the walls of Jerusalem at that moment in history. And one experiences in following that compass bearing a sense of this, that in the story that is in the Bible of the life of Jesus Christ, the bulk of it is about, over a third of it is about, the journey to the cross and the resurrection. What this immediately impinges on us is a recognition that in the end, God has the last word. In the face of sin, wickedness, evil, desolation, and yes, death itself, 
God has the last word. So, we also find that this is a gift, a free, undeserved gift, and we use the word grace here. There's nothing we can do to deserve this love, nothing we can do to deserve this story, nothing we can do of ourselves to make much difference, but through the free, undeserved gift of this life and faith in him, something changes, forgiveness happens, and hope is born. And in relation to that good and helpful section that you had about the moral compass, there is, because as we look at this life, there is sometimes when we can find ourselves asking, in this context, what would Jesus do? And then thirdly, we see a life in God that sees his spirit and all goodness and in everything that is life-giving. The first Pentecost, when the Spirit was given to the first Christians, ordinary, uneducated, helpless, defeated people were transformed. And in their lifetime, they got the gospel, they got the message of the peace of God and the person and work of Jesus Christ right to the heart of the Roman Empire in their time. They were transformed. So in the Spirit we see the beyond human, transforming love of God that can enable wonderful things to happen. And this can lead us to respect people because this life is not just devoted to one particular religious group or another, but to all humanity. The spirit is beyond all, any one particular religious group. So those are the compasses, creator, redeemer, life giver. The practice of that is in, again in our tradition, in the encouragement to attend worship, for teaching, for the expression of faithfulness, for prayer, and for fellowship. The study of the Bible which just a little bit every day, a short recitation, the learning of a verse on a regular basis, engaging with it critically, absolutely yes in our tradition. But it forms us and gets to the heart of who we are. One person I once said, it's a bit like pickling onions. If, I don't know if you pickle onions or any vegetable or fruit, if you steep it in vinegar long enough, it gets right to the centre. It not only preserves it, but it transforms it. The same happens with the study of scripture, of any tradition. It helps to form who we are. And prayer, of course. And we too expect to see the results uh, of that enterprise in service, in our households, in giving, in rest and recreation in self-examination, in hope, and in peace. So at the last day, this is the faith I expect to be judged by. And if I only managed a small bit, I trust that God in his infinite mercy may smile and say to me, as he will to each of you, welcome home, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, there are translations of the Bible. Now, what is the latest statistics? I was looking at this in one of our groups um, a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, I think there are several thousand uh, because the Bible is translated in nearly every language in the world, and there are thousands of those. Uh, the version on the table here uh, was not the first translation in the English language. That took place really in the 15th century. But the, what really transformed uh, the history of the Christian church was the uh, inventing of the, the printing press. And the, um, the, the, the transformation of the cultures in Western Europe in what was called humanism at the day, at the day uh, which was a renaissance of learning 
and uh, there was a movement within the church at the time that the people should be able to read the scriptures for themselves. Uh, at that time, the, the translation that was used was the Latin translation of the original languages of, of Greek uh, and of Hebrew. Uh, and uh, there was a Latin translation made which, was, which served the church very well um, for a good thousand years or so of, of England in the early 17th century, which again stood very good, um, very good wear. Until the time it became, there are, there are many different manuscripts um, and uh, fragments of manuscripts which contain particularly the letters of the New Testament and the Gospels. They're not hugely different, but they, keep, they kept on finding older ones and ones that could, be, could actually produce a more accurate and primitive version uh, of, the, of, of the Greek scriptures of the New Testament, as we call them. And uh, there, there continues to be um, a, a desire not only to translate accurately, but also in a language that the people can understand in any generation. Uh, and so there, there are numerous, there are uh, probably hundreds of translations in the English language, but I'd be right in saying I'm looking at a, a professor of divinity here who <laughs> can help me uh, a little bit. But, uh, but certainly, so that, that, uh, there, is, there is the... Um, uh, sense of we want a translation that the people can understand and use. That very quickly, uh, no, there isn't. Uh, because, not least because uh, we, we know that Jesus' own language was Aramaic, and there is nothing that goes back. There, there are a few fragments of Aramaic around. But the first Bibles, the, the, the first Gospels, the Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and then John, and the, the primitive writing, the, the epistles, which were written down, we believe, slightly before the, the Gospels, they were all written then in what we call New Testament Greek, the slang Greek, which was the common parlance of the time. Um, thank you very much for these two very, uh, very interesting, thought-provoking questions. I might start with the second one. Um, it's very nice to see that you think that Muslims are united. <laughs> um, that, is, that is very flattering indeed. Um, but as you, as you uh, noticed correctly, we do not have a hierarchical structure in Islam um, such that there is an institution which has the, the sole right to interpret the scripture or to apply uh, rulings. Um, there will always be the, the supremacy or the, the authority belongs to the Qur'an and to the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him. When the Prophet Muhammad was alive, uh, he was the authority in the religious sense and also in the earthly sense for his followers. Uh, but then after his passing, there were, there were, to some extent, there were levels of conflict uh, which occurred and there were different paths that were taken in regards to how to keep the community united. Um, and so there were uh, successors appointed in the community, but those successors were not understood to have the authority of a prophet. But they were held to account on the basis of following the, the, the Qur'an, the scripture, and the prophet. So the Qur'an itself says, Obey God and obey the messenger, and those with authority among you. So uh, obey God and obey the messenger and those with authority among you. So the word obey is not repeated here. It's not obey God and obey the messenger and obey. But rather, obey them insofar as they obey God and the messenger. And then the verse goes on to spell it out and it says, But if you should dispute over anything, then return the matter to God and his messenger. Which after... Um, you know, that period of prophethood means the Qur'an and the compiled example and teachings of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, so, there is that still authority with regards to how do we know what is right and what is wrong, and what should be the law, but there are different ways of interpreting, there are different legal schools which continue to exist, um, and there have been earthly authorities 
um, which have existed at various times, which we don't have at this particular moment in time. We do have, of course, various countries that uh, consider themselves to be Muslim countries. They might claim that their laws are based upon Islamic law. Um, but at the end of the day, they cannot have that claim that they are really representing Islam in that, that level of authority and that, that definitive uh, meaning. Rather, they are subservient to the law of Islam if they claim to be uh, followers of it. Um, so, yes, it's, it's quite a chaotic thing, but it has its positives as well, in that there is room for debate, and I, I like the word democracy. I hope, you know, I hope that could be reflected um, you know, in our reality to some extent, but um, there is room for you know, people adopting one view or adopting another view. Where that becomes difficult sometimes is where there are so many disparate views and disagreements, and almost you wish that there was somebody who could say to us, well, this is the way we're doing it. Not because I am the, uh, the final word of the authority, but because I've been appointed by you to settle the dispute. So that is the role of, of an earthly authority as well. Um, with regards to the, uh, slavery specifically, um, we, it, it's certainly the case that there are verses in the Quran which um, make reference to, to slaves, but when it does so, there are certain rules pertaining to them, and there are, certain, there are certain rules which are being taught to people concerning them and towards them. So, for example, the freeing of slaves. Freeing slaves was something which was instituted as uh, a penance or uh, an expiation for certain um, you know, sins and for certain errors. You know, if someone does such and such, uh, then his remittance is that he must free a slave. So, in general, what we see in the, in the era of prophethood, in the era of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, was an attempt to close the, 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 the sources of slavery, those means by which people have become slaves, but to widen the, the exit points for, for slaves to become free. Um, and there were numerous ways and numerous um, things which were instituted in that regard. So it is fair to say and to assess from an Islamic perspective that there was a project here to bring an end to the dependence upon slavery, which could not have been done overnight, because slavery is something which was, um, and one can argue still is, but we like to say that slavery is modern, but there are modern day forms of slavery as well, upon which economies are built, and whether we like it or not, upon which our economy depends as well, or our purchases and our, um, you know, our lifestyles depend upon hidden forms of slavery that we don't like to even admit exist while we pat ourselves on the back that we have abolished slavery and that we don't believe in any barbaric um, religion that calls for it. Rather, what I believe uh, that, we can, that we can find the message of the Islamic scripture was to bring an end to slavery, but it would take time. Uh, it would take time. Um, at the same time, that's not necessarily how everyone understood from day one. Um, and one can find things in, the, in some books of law and so on concerning slaves, which also, you know, give you goosebumps. But there's a difference between that and the scripture itself. So that's where I say that, yes, we are entitled to revisit the scripture, maybe bypassing some of the uh, commentary that has accrued over it, to say, well, now can we think about the, these commentaries as being out of place by studying more carefully the scripture itself.